hello and welcome to the Creepy Pasta Ed podcast. I'm your host and lovable storyteller, Ed. I'd like to dedicate this episode to the respectable short horror writer, Ben Braun. The stories you will hear tonight are all written by Ben Braun and narrated by yours truly. Background music by Kevin McLeod. But before we get into the heart of the beast, I'd like you to visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash creepypasta ed. Become a patron and get awesome perks. Why not follow us on Twitter at creepypasta ed? Now, with that being said, we can begin. This first piece is entitled, I Saw Something in the Ravine. Before I tell you exactly what I witnessed, I want to make a few things clear. I live in an urban center with a fairly high population. With a network of ravines throughout, there are all kinds of animals, skunks, raccoons, moles, squirrels, and even coyotes. These animals and more are easy to see if you spend a little time in the ravine. Nothing compares to what I've seen. It started with the missing posters. Whenever I took my dog for a walk, I would see missing cat posters, and I would see more each time I went out. Every day, I'd see the faces of lost cats plastered on every telephone pole I walked past. It was strange how many there were. Every day, a few more cats would go missing, and you'd have more crying kids, more worry in the community, and more missing posters. At the point that my neighbor's cat went missing, it was such a problem it became a local news story. Among the distraught former cat owners that were interviewed, there was my neighbor. She and I both had houses that backed onto the ravine. You could walk directly into the ravine from my backyard. Around 10 p.m., my neighbor let her cat out of the house to do her business. After only a minute of her cat walking around the backyard, a low growl and the sound of the cat in distress was heard in the pitch black yard. She grabbed a flashlight and ran out, only to discover blood drying in the dirt, leading into the ravine accompanied by tracks. Everyone figured it was coyotes. Everyone's assumption was confirmed when a lady went downstairs in the middle of the night to grab some food. She looked through her glass back door to see four yellow eyes staring back at her. Two coyotes. The volume at which cats were disappearing was surprisingly growing every night. Most people kept a strict eye on their pets around that time, like they should. One night, I sat in a chair on my back porch late at night, letting my dog out. There's a chain link fence separating my backyard from the ravine with a gate. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up all of a sudden, and even though I hadn't seen or heard anything yet, I felt something. I sensed that something was there. I saw two yellow eyes, like the ones the lady saw behind the fence. They were staring directly at me. Two more emerged from the ravine, finding their place next to the first pair. I heard a low growl, loud enough to be heard from my place on the porch. That's when I saw the third set of eyes. Their color deviated from the yellowish coloring of the other animals, and I saw that they possessed 
a more orange color. This thing was impossibly tall. It must have stood at nine feet, towering over the fence. My dog barked and whimpered, running to the back door, pawing and scratching it. I ran back inside with my dog, and I barely got any sleep that night. What the hell was that thing? Then a bloodhound went like the rest of the cats. This was surprising to most, and I figured there must be multiple coyotes hunting their prey at once. A bloodhound could probably put up a good fight. This brings me to what I experienced. My encounter happened in broad daylight. I was walking my Australian Shepherd, and it started like any other walk. We went walking in the ravine, entering right from my backyard. My dog walked at a moderate pace, sniffing everything in his path, and perking up when he saw a squirrel. He required pretty long and frequent walks, so I knew the ravine well enough. I wasn't too concerned about the whole coyote problem, and I knew a coyote wouldn't attack my dog when I am with him. I've heard coyotes are skittish. At some point on our walk, maybe a mile or two, he stopped. He completely froze, and he stopped sniffing around. For a full minute, he just stood completely still, then he sat. I didn't tell him to sit or anything. He just sat on his own. I tugged at his lead, but that received no response. I heard a stick crack somewhere nearby ahead of us, and he started whimpering. Whatever he was afraid of was just up ahead and around the corner. I was kind of curious of what it was, so I tried going forward. I finally pulled on the leash hard enough for him to follow me, and off we went around the corner. I walked slowly and carefully, making sure I didn't make too much noise. My dog walked right behind me, hiding behind my legs as we walked. As my hiking boots became caked with mud as I walked by the stream, I noticed the smell. The farther I got around the turn, the more putrid the stench was. It was like rotting meat mixed with wet dog, with a slight metallic ring to it. As I got halfway around the turn, I saw the cat. It lay in the mud, causing its white fur to become a dirty brown. It was clearly dead, probably for several days. There were chunks of flesh ripped from its side and stomach, and its neck had been torn open. Flies buzzed around the carcass, causing the whole experience of finding this dead pet to be increasingly dreadful. I heard a growl nearby, and the sound of ripping and tearing, with a bit of crunching adding to the disgusting sound. I finished the turn, and I finally got a good look at the source of the noise, and the reason for the dead cat. It led to a more open space with trees along the side of it, and a large tree in the center. I saw a coyote near the middle tree eating something laying on the ground. The fur on its face was matted with blood, and each time it raised its head, blood dripped from its maw. There was a second coyote pacing around the open space, holding a dead, mangled cat in its mouth. From the branches of the tree, dead cats hung from ropes. Their collar tags glinted in the sunlight, and their limbs dangled weakly from their deteriorating bodies. There was a creature unlike any I've ever seen before, standing at the side of the area. It had black fur and gray spots on its chin. It stood at what I can only assume to be nine feet tall, and this terrified me the most. It had shortish legs compared to the rest of its body. Its arms were very long, and it had hands. Well, they looked similar to claws, but they obviously possessed the capabilities of human hands. It stood upright like a human, 
and its ears looked like those of German shepherds. Its snout was long, and its mouth stretched into a mocking sneer. The thing grunted and stomped its foot into the ground, and the second coyote stopped pacing. It walked over to the thing and sat right in front of it, staring intently up at the creature. The tall dog-like creature bent down, picking up a long stick. The coyote continued staring, not breaking its focus. The creature snapped the stick into two and made a quick, growling sound. The coyote dropped the cat it had in its mouth and trotted off into the distance. The thing had just told the coyote to do something. It was like it had trained it. My dog was whimpering softly, and after I saw this, my mouth hung open, and I was disturbed. I snapped out of my trance, and my dog and I ran off in the direction of my house as fast as we could. This freakishly tall dog-like thing had coyotes doing its goddamn bidding. It had trained them to do commands, and that scares me. I don't know what the hell it is, or why it's doing this, but there's a thing in the ravine, and I don't know what it will do next. wasn't that tasty. Before we get into the next story, I'd like to encourage you to look the Creepypasta Ed channel up on YouTube and Vidme. Be sure to follow and subscribe for your weekly dose of the strange, horrific, and macabre. Now, this next piece I like to call The Disappearing Game. William was on his 13th hour of straight driving, speeding down a highway halfway between Oregon and Maine, running on too many caffeine pills. He was fleeing from home from what he had witnessed. A week ago, William and his friends were watching the Die Hard series at his house. The hours ticked by as their words became more and more slurred, and their conversation became less and less coherent. They were having fun, and since his ten-year-old son was out at a sleepover with his friend, and his wife was out at a party for work, they were howling with laughter louder than ever at each other's jokes. His friend, David, drunkenly communicated to the group, The third one sucks. The fourth is better. Shouts and groans of disagreement filled the room. Bouncing off the walls, bombarding David with objection, Hugh, a thin red-haired gentleman who happened to be a friend of theirs, agreed with David. The fourth was better than the third. What's so fucking hard about accepting that? Another friend of William's, clearly more intoxicated than the rest, shouted something speculating that Hugh had no soul. Just as Hugh was about to shoot back at him, the room fell silent, as they all heard the same sound. Heavy footsteps upstairs. William slowly rose from the couch and began to search the basement for a baseball bat as quietly as he could. Jack, the drunkest of them all, spoke a little too loud. Fuck! Is that a burglar? The other four, William, David, and Hugh, and Andrew, shushed him simultaneously. Shh! Andrew had just left the bathroom, after being there for the first two acts of Die Hard 3, shaking his wet hands all over the carpeted floor. After muting the TV, William slowly began treading cautiously up the stairs. The rest stayed behind as he reached the top step, Clutching the bat with both hands, he knew it wasn't his wife home early. 
the remarkably heavy breathing he heard was that of a man's. Now on the main floor, he could see the intruder. A man stood in the living room, standing at a very average height, in clothes that looked like they had been worn for two months straight without being washed. They probably had. The man looked like a meth addict, and his eyes bulged like he had recently seen a ghost. His hair was long and matted, and when he spoke, it was raspy, and it sounded like he was out of breath. Something sent me. They need Sean. William didn't register the man's words at first. He was too transfixed on the handgun the man was holding at his side. The only thing that intimidated William was the gun. The man didn't seem to want to harm anyone. He looked scared. Please, just tell me where Sean is. You'll regret it if you don't. I don't want to. Not anyone else. William snapped out of his trance and looked back up at the man's crazed eyes. William shouted, What the fuck do you want with my son? The intruder flinched, and his face looked like he was on the brink of crying. The man choked out the words, Please, please don't send me back. I don't want to do it. You know I don't. The man began crying trying to fight back tears begging to escape. He wiped away the tears with his free hand, looking down at the floor. William began slowly backing up as he realized that he knew why this man had come. Fifteen years ago, William had performed the disappearing game. He had erased his stepfather, the stepfather that had once beat him and his mother. The stepfather that had once slashed the wheels on the car that he bought with his own money. The stepfather that he fucking hated. But William knew that the spirit that had helped him erase his stepfather from existence wanted him to pay back his debt by letting it erase his son. He had been warned of his debt numerous times. It came to him in his dreams, and it whispered to him when he was alone, but he chose to ignore it. William was helpless to do anything as the man walked down the steps to the basement. Sirens could be heard in the distance as there were multiple popping sounds, screaming and sobbing between gunshots. The police found the man in the basement curled up on the ground, sobbing, holding the gun in his mouth. He had pulled the trigger on himself, but the clip was empty. It had only given him enough bullets for William's friends. After questioning, William saw his family again. They had stayed in his sister's house for a few days, and William stayed in bed not speaking for the few days they spent in there. After his wife tripped down the stairs and broke her neck, William snapped. He took his son and began driving. Now, he's driving down a highway halfway between Oregon and Maine, running away from his past on too many caffeine pills. He's regretting playing the disappearing game, but he knows it's too late. He knows that no matter how fast he drives, it's just a matter of time. He can see a police car behind him, most likely after him for the ridiculous speed he's driving at. However, that may not be it, as he can see the officer's wide bloodshot eyes, the terrified look on his face, and the pistol laying on his dashboard. Isn't that haunting? Remember to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at CreepyPastaEd. Check us out on Facebook as well. 
Now, I've saved the best for last. This one is entitled, The Gift of the Glow. I can tell if someone is a bad person or not. I've always been able to do it. And it's just a natural thing for me. Bad people have a certain glow in their eyes, and I can see it if I look at them with enough focus and concentration. The first time I noticed a bad person, I was two years old. My mother was carrying me around in a grocery store, and I was just looking around curiously from where I was up high. I saw a man wearing a black jacket emerge from one of the aisles, and I saw his head snap to where I was. He stared at me, and a grin spread across his face as he waved at me. He slowly sauntered up to me until he was around ten feet behind my mother, and I was staring at him over her shoulder. He pulled a small digital camera out of his jacket and smiled at me. My head started to hurt and I began to cry. As the man started taking pictures of me and my mother, I cried louder. My mother noticed and set me down. I pointed to the man behind her and she wheeled around. The man was already running towards the candy aisle, but he didn't make it very far. As he reached the aisle, he ran into a much larger man. He ran directly into him, and his camera fell and smashed into the ground as he fell backwards. He fell onto the floor, and a loud crack was audible from where I was as the back of his skull hit the hard floor. Paramedics came, and he was carried out of the store on a stretcher. The headache subsided, and I noticed the large man from before standing in the street with a proud look on his face as we left the store. That was the last time I saw him. The second time, I really noticed a bad person. I was five. I was at the bank with my dad, standing next to him in line. I picked up the stench of rotting meat, and I heard the sound of flies buzzing. It sounded like they were right next to my head, but there was nothing there. In the line next to us, I saw a woman with the glow. She was wearing a striped sweater and black sweatpants, her unkempt pitch black hair falling down her shoulders. She had a look of anxiety on her face, and she was twitching and fidgeting in line, like an impatient child. I felt like throwing up and I fought back gags. I knew what this woman did. She was a lonely, divorced, middle-aged, overweight woman with anxiety issues. She tried to be a good person, but she found it very hard. There was no place to turn to when she had problems with work, no person to vent to when someone insulted her, and no one to tell her she was beautiful when someone told her she wasn't. There was no place to channel her anger, so she made one. Every time she couldn't handle her problems, she would yell at her little cocker spaniel. That soon escalated to kicking it, then to starving it. She didn't only take care of her anger with this abuse, she ended up taking some sort of sick pleasure from it. And that morning, she was so fed up with her life that she crushed half of its skull with a 14-pound hammer. I was so overwhelmed by the vision and the smell of rotting meat and the sound of flies buzzing and muffled yelping that I vomited all over the floor. This woman was so disgusting. My five-year-old mind couldn't handle it and I passed out. I had a dream that I would never forget while I was out. I saw the woman from the bank walking down a busy street. She was smiling, her teeth stained with blood, brown hair stuck around her mouth. 
some sticking to her teeth. She walked to the front of the grocery store, and I noticed the large man from three years ago looking at her from the window. He had his face pressed up against the glass from inside the store, with a proud look on his face. The woman realized he was staring and she backed up, away from the door. I heard sounds of banging from above the street, like sounds I hear when I pass a construction site. A hammer falls from the roof of the grocery store and strikes the woman in the forehead. The large man doesn't flinch, and I hear him laugh. Everything becomes blurry, and the world starts spinning. I smell vomit, rotting meat, and pure death. That's when I woke up. I was laying in a hospital bed, with my parents standing around. My mother saw that I had woken up, and she grabs a hold of my small hand. She asks if I'm okay, but I don't answer. I am too fixated on the woman wearing the striped sweater and black sweatpants, being wheeled by the door. Even though I only see it for a few seconds, I can tell something is off about her head. It's only half intact. Over the years, I have been witness to similar occurrences. As child abusers, pedophiles, a wife beater, a murderer, and people of that nature began slowly dropping when I noticed them. I knew crystal clear what the gift I possessed was. The murderer had strangled his girlfriend to death in his car, proceeding to bury her body in a nearby park in the middle of the park. After I stared at him at a mall, he died in his house alone. I recognized his face on the news, and it turns out he choked on his food alone in his house, with no one there to save him. It's embarrassing, really to die in such a way. All the rest died in their own special ways. I was sure to check the news each time I noticed a really bad person. I had come to terms with the rare gift I had, and I felt a feeling of control, and that my morals were in check. I saw the pedophile on the news in a courtroom when I was fourteen. He was sitting with his lawyer and the courtroom was orderly and quiet. That's when I saw something else that the others couldn't see. The large man standing behind the judge, staring at the camera with a proud look on his face. He wore a black leather jacket and jeans. He looked fairly normal, despite his height being something like six foot nine. I was completely perplexed for a minute, just staring at his smiling face, no doubt looking at me. There was one thing truly wrong with what I saw. The strange, seemingly invisible man had the glow. The next day, I heard a knock at the door. I slowly stepped down the stairs, still shaken up by what I saw on the TV. There was no one outside, only a white envelope sitting on the welcome mat. I grabbed it and quickly shut the door, with the strange feeling that if I left it open any longer, something could get in. Something bad. I didn't open the envelope until after dinner, and even then I was hesitant. Upon opening it, there was a single piece of white paper with two sentences written on it in black ink. How are you liking your gift? I just knew you should have it. Such a malleable soul. Months later, I found out that the pedophile from the TV had died in prison. He was stabbed to death by another inmate who claimed that a man told him he was evil. He said the man had authority over him, that he had power over everything. Now, 21, 
I still have the gift. I feel sick, and the man won't stop showing me bad people. They're everywhere, and it's corroding my mind. Every day I wake up, I see the dark side of everything. I see everything. Maybe in a past life, I made a deal with the devil. If I did, it carried on with me to the next. So please beware the gift of the glow. Thank you for listening to the Creepy Pasta Ed podcast. If you would like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash creepypasta ed. Becoming a patron has awesome rewards. Remember to check our YouTube and Vidme channels out, and don't forget to follow and subscribe, if you dare. And remember, don't fall asleep.